thanks to all of you for the opportunity to think about how God has worked in my life. I became a Christian when I was just a couple of months old. Now, you may think that's strange, but on my behalf, my parents and godparents accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. On my behalf, they affirmed that I put my whole trust in His grace and His love. Once baptized, the minister proclaimed that I had been raised to a new life in Christ, that I had been sealed by the Holy Spirit, that I had been marked as Christ's own forever, and that hereafter I shall not be ashamed to confess the faith of Christ crucified. Now I know that those of you who are members of traditions that don't believe in infant baptism may think this is a very unusual place to start. But I believe something real, something very real and very important happened when I was baptized 62 years ago. And I begin here because that moment of being born anew when I was a helpless baby who brought absolutely nothing to the table was emblematic of a pervasive dynamic throughout my own journey of faith. And that dynamic is this. The initiative has always come from God. The initiative has always come from God, who at critical junctures put someone in my path who steered me one step closer to Him. First, there were my parents and my grandparents my earliest bedtime memories involve my father and or mother kneeling beside me to say prayers. My grandparents, especially my grandmothers, exuded a sense of God's ever-present reality. I grew up in a God-infused universe, and the image of God that I absorbed was that of a loving, somewhat removed, mostly incomprehensible and unknowable God. Two months ago, some of you were here when Richard Gwathme spoke. He's sitting right there. Like Richard, I grew up in what was the predominantly Christian culture of the late 1950s and early 1960s at St. James Episcopal Church in downtown Wilmington. I was in church every Sunday. I was in church every single of the 40 days in Lent from the 4th through the 7th grades. And that last year was to prepare for our confirming the baptismal covenant that our parents and grandparents had made on our behalf when we were infants. We all had to choose adult mentors. Mine was the second most important figure that God put in my path. He was a traditional churchman. He ran an insurance agency. His name was Alan Strange. And I emerged from our weekly meetings with him convinced more than ever that this business of Christ and the church and faith was very real and very serious, serious underlined. Like Richard, uh, I attended Episcopal High School, which is a Virginia boarding school across the Potomac River from Washington, D.C. Every morning began with chapel, every Sunday was church, and we had in our curriculum a, a broad scattering of, 
of, of Bible and theology and Christian ethics. So by the time I reached my mid to late teens, I actually knew a fair amount about God. Uh, but like many from my background, I didn't really know God. I didn't even know that one could know God. My faith was really a bit abstract, a bit in the head. And consequently, it was subject to all kinds of intellectual doubts. By the midpoint of my senior year in high school, I came to believe that all of the knowledge of God to which I had been exposed was actually nothing more than a man-made myth. I came to believe that there was no such thing as God. No creator, no savior, no pervading spirit, and therefore really no purpose to life. How this view captured me, I really don't know, but it did, and it was very real, and it had a somewhat depressing effect. For the first time ever, I felt pretty much that everything was essentially pointless. Now, it may have been just a case of teenage angst, pretty common for those years, but this was a very real existential experience for me. Although I had written God off, he had not written me off, thankfully. He put our school chaplain, a man named Jack Smith, in my path. One day he asked me in my senior year if I would consider working as a counselor at the summer camp he ran in the Shenandoah Mountains. I told Jack, you've got the wrong guy. Uh, I don't know anything about kids. I don't think I really like kids. And by the way, I don't believe in God anymore. His reply astounded me. He said, I don't care. I want you on the staff. Think about it. Though I did not understand it at the time, this was a pivotal moment for me of receiving God's grace. I no more deserved a job as a camp counselor than I deserved a job as an astronaut. However, Jack Smith saw in me possibilities that I did not see in myself. He regarded me as more, much more than who I actually was. And once I joined St. George's camp staff, he elicited from me more than I ever dreamed was within me. I loved every role I played. I was a given a heart for the kids. I saw God at work around me. It was a powerful, powerful turning point for me. To my mind, it was all because Jack Smith put in practice an important theological dynamic. It's called imputation. It's when one is regarded or looked upon or judged as different from one's naked self. When in total shame because of his sin, King David says or exclaims in the Psalms, happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity. Jesus imputes to us his righteousness, his perfection, seeing us as though, in a sense, we were he 
and not the imperfect selves that we are. So when Jack Smith imputed to me capacities where I perceived only inadequacies, he changed my life. He changed my life. I had a real mountaintop experience in those Virginia mountains. Now any of you who climb mountains know that the descent from a mountaintop can be treacherous. By the end of my first semester at Chapel Hill, go Tar Heels, my faith had evaporated again. My idyllic summer experience could not withstand the intellectual onslaught of the secular writers in whose work I became immersed. And I guess bowing to lots of peer pressure around me, I bought into the crazy idea that to be a Christian is to be weak, to be ignorant, and to be uncool. This time God put two people in my path. The first was this guy right over here, Richard Goffme, who had just recently had the dramatic conversion experience that some of you heard about two months ago. On a winter road trip to Charlottesville, where Richard had just entered law school, I decided to look up this longtime family friend. Over lunch, which happened to be nothing but a plain hot dog, with no bun and no condiments in Richard's apartment, <laughs> Richard recounted in great detail this amazing encounter he had had with God when he was a taxi driver the year before in Washington, D.C. I was mesmerized, and I could feel cracks appear in my disbelief. The second person God put in my path was the dead English poet T.S. Eliot. I had been drawn to the richness of his language coupled with his early, very bleak vision expressed in poems like The Wasteland um, that was largely, like so many of his generation, uh, prompted by his witnessing the senseless death and destruction of the First World War. So I'd started reading his poems and I'd embarked on a semester-long study of his work only to discover this extraordinary trajectory that he went through from sort of the depths of despair to a re-embrace of Christianity as he became a devout Anglican. And for this adolescent seeing that one of the great literary and intellectual figures of the early to mid 20th century could believe the old, old gospel story, then I could too. That it actually had intellectual merit, that there was truth there. It was not a myth. One was not necessarily ignorant or uncool to believe it. At some point that spring, I pulled out a copy of that simple prayer of acceptance that someone along the way had given me that I'd filed away, and I asked Jesus to come into my life as my Lord and my Savior and to stay there this time. That summer, I returned to St. George's camp. Again, I saw God at work all around me, and I began to personally experience a taste of his love. And that taste cemented this direction toward him that had mostly been, prior to that time, a more intellectual kind of odyssey. Further cementing that direction during my remaining college years was the wind of spiritual renewal that was blowing through my family, starting with my mother, and then on to my father, who's sitting right over there. 
And I could see in them that a whole new world was opening up for, for them. That was a great validation. And when I moved to New York City after graduation, God put another family member in my path. This time it was my uncle, Bill Murkison. He invited me to, to join him for lunch uh, and a Thanksgiving dinner afterwards at his church, Grace Church in Lower Manhattan. And there I met this extraordinary group of gifted, accomplished, older adults who were deeply committed to their faith. And they kept me from drifting away in the big city. Through Grace Church, I came to know really for the first time that I came to understand the transforming power of God's amazing grace for an ordinary guy like me. I came to believe deep in my gut and not just in my head that God really loved me. Not for what I was doing, not for what I'd done, not for what I would ever do, but just because that's what God does. That's who God is. And during those years at Grace Church, God put a particularly wonderful person in my path. She would become my wife, Linda. We'd been uh, attending the same church for three years, but we'd never laid eyes on each other. The moment I met her, I was immediately smitten. She just radiated such beauty. As I got to know her, I realized that that beauty came from a level of spiritual depth that I had rarely encountered in anyone. Completely in love at that point, I was willing to do things that I would never do otherwise. I joined her weekly prayer group. Now, I'd never prayed extemporaneously out loud in my life. Her group did that all the time, every week. It was terrifying. <laughs> we went to church retreats. I thought they would be really weird. They turned out to be great. I had tended to compartmentalize my business life and my spiritual life, and she challenged me to think differently. Before we were married, I had begun to make a meaningful, ongoing financial contribution to God's work. However, I was very, very clear with God that my tithe would be based on after-tax income. <laughs> Once we were married, Linda challenged me on that idea as well. In fact, Linda has played a critical role in helping me face two of my deepest spiritual challenges. Namely, my resistance to ceding to God control over what I think of as my money. And secondly, relatedly, a fear of there not being enough. While those challenges have not completely disappeared, I have grown to a point where we happily give a percentage of our income that I would never have thought possible, that in fact I would have thought imprudent and downright reckless. And still, I now feel that we actually have enough. When we moved to Wilmington so I could join my father in our family sporting goods and hardware business, God put another important person in my life. He was a fellow business person who was as ambitious as I was about growing a company and is interested in figuring out how to carry his Christian faith into his role leading a business. Come back next month and you'll hear him, Bill Morris, tell you his story. Over the past 30 years, Bill has challenged me, encouraged me, and inspired me. Come hear him. 
Around the time that we sold our business to a merger partner in 1989, God put another man in my path. This one caused a lot of soul searching, though he never knew it. This man was a customer who was opening a new location. And I went to the ribbon cutting where his pastor played a big role and talked about all the great things that this man had done and what a spiritual pillar he was of their church. A few weeks later, I traveled to visit this customer. He had wanted to tell me about his aggressive growth plans. And when he laid out his plan to put his prime customer out of business, I was rather taken aback. And I said, how does this mesh with all the things that your pastor said at your ribbon cutting? He looked at me very sternly and he said, when I'm in church on Sunday, I am all in. But come Monday morning, I'm all business. And it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. That conversation really troubled me. I couldn't get it out of my mind. I wondered, is that what it takes to succeed? Am I more like that guy than I think I am? Do business and Christianity mix at all? And then came a piece of news that brought my own business life crashing down. The company to which we had sold, totally out of the blue, filed for bankruptcy. <coughs> like a small version of Enron or WorldCom, they, had been, they were an audited, publicly traded company that had been the victim of long-standing, undetected internal fraud. Now, I had been the driving force behind this sale, which was part cash and part owner-financed notes. If it turned out badly for the family, I would be responsible. And, not, and for the next year and a half, I would have to help a hundred people find other work before our doors were forever closed. It drove me to my knees. It drove me to depend on God's mercy in a way that I never had before. I kept asking, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to see? And after months of desperately praying with no seeming answer, one morning I was studying the Bible and scripture spoke to me in a way that it had not done before. You may remember when Jesus was baptized and again when he was transfigured, there's a voice from heaven that says, this is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. It felt like God was saying that to me about me. Regardless of the mess I had made, I heard God saying to me, you are my son, my beloved. St. Paul says that through the blood of Christ, you and I have been adopted as sons. We have been adopted as fellow heirs with Jesus. That's grace. <laughs> And I hung on to that pronouncement of God's amazing grace for dear life until God put another man in my path. A clergy friend of ours down in Charleston uh, had gone to seminary in England where one of his professors and mentors was a man named George Carey who had just been anointed as the Archbishop of Canterbury. And he was visiting our friend who invited us to come down to see him. Over lunch, uh, Lynn and I were talking to him, with him about some of our dreams about studying theology abroad. And we forgot, thought nothing more of it. 
until a few months later we received a letter from the Dean of Trinity College at Anglican Seminary in Bristol, England, inviting us to come visit them to see if it would make sense for them to put together a course of study for us. He said that Archbishop Carey had talked to us, talked to them about us. Linda and I looked at each other and said, I think God's talking to us. So we went to Bristol. It was an extraordinary, extraordinary experience. Uh, one of the most important and fruitful in our lives. By the end of that time, I was um, enrolled as a PhD student in Christian ethics at the University of Bristol. And uh, we came back to England because you can do that work in, in a UK uh, university from anywhere. You don't go to class, it's all research. And I was looking for a way to make a living. And then another man was put in my path. This time, it was a man who had been for years our family financial advisor, Carter Mebbin, sitting right over there. And I went to Carter and I said, you know, Carter, I've always been in, interested in the financial markets. I had financial clients in New York. I wonder if this business might be a fit for me while I do this PhD project. He was encouraging. He understood my faith commitment. He thought it would be a fit. One thing led to another and I wound up now having spent nearly 23 years in, in, in this business. Um, I could go on and on. There are so many different people who God has put in my path. But it's so clear when I look back that he has been active from the beginning he has never let me go, and he has worked in my life in this particular way. When we went to Bristol, the professor of pastoral theology asked us, how has God tended to work in your life? We'd never been asked that question before, but it, became, it was clear to me then that God had worked in my life by putting people in my path. And as I look back in the rearview mirror, it is so clear. I would bet you could look back at your life and see that there might be a particular pattern to how God has worked in your particular life. Probably different from mine, but I bet it's there. And I'd simply encourage you to, to, to think about that. I want to thank you for the opportunity to reflect on this pattern of God working in my life, and, uh, and I hope that this, these remarks have been of some interest. Thank you very much.